There is a sense in which the end of the world is an escape to many people. People on the far right believe that the trajectory which has been in place since the sexual revolution is so terrible that it would be preferable for civilization to collapse rather than uh, for us to live in this rootless world which the bohemian elite have built. As such, apocalyptic predictions serve either as wish fulfillment or as a cope to deal with the crushing reality of the modern world. I hold views which to many are either aggressively pessimistic or outright apocalyptic. Those views are that industrial civilization will in fact only be a short phase in the history of the human race, that resource depletion will ultimately lead to a Malthusian catastrophe and ultimately a regression into a primarily agrarian existence for all of the foreseeable future of human history. My friend Argent criticized these views as being a wish fulfillment. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, though, humanity was stuck within a state of equilibrium, where births and deaths were held at a more or less constant level. Thomas Malthus was an economist, Anglican priest, and scientist who lived in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. He was the first to describe humanity hovering around a constant carrying capacity or limit of population growth. In short, improvement to food production or infrastructure would lead to a short increase in the quality of life, but over time humans would not be able to enjoy this new abundance indefinitely. Ultimately, we would increase our population to match this increase in productivity until we were pushed once again into a subsistence level. Essentially, humanity will expand until it hits a natural limit. This natural limit exists in all species and is known as a carrying capacity. This tendency of advancements in food production only to lead humanity being stuck once again in subsistence is known as the Malthusian trap. Following the Industrial Revolution, where resources and labor-saving technology exploded, it seemed that humanity had outstripped its natural limits and had escaped the Malthusian trap. Ultimately, though, this prediction is premature. If resources, which allow for industrial technology to function, were to run out or to be cut off from use for this society, the vast population increases in the modern world would ultimately be unsustainable. The maximum of a billion people who were sustainable in the original agricultural world would be all that we could sustain. The excess world population above this one billion would then die off in a massive bottleneck episode. This collapse in population is known as the Malthusian catastrophe. This outcome is what people who believe in collapse more or less believe is inevitable. Now, let's go back in time a little bit to talk about an earlier time within the internet, the 2000s. Then there was this peak oil movement, or this peak oil blogosphere, which believed that a Malthusian collapse was imminent, and this would be due to a global peak in oil production. A lot of these people were preppers, which is a subculture of intentionally hoarding resources because you expect there to be a drastic catastrophe for the in the near future where you won't be able to get those resources and there'll be sustained chaos. These peak oil believers or the peak oil blogosphere was prepping for the shock to the oil market which they believed would crash the global economy and cause massive shortages. In some cases they weren't just prepping by buying extra supplies. They were in fact shifting their lifestyles to be less dependent upon car culture and the power grid. Ultimately, though, this movement crumbled because their apocalypse has never occurred. Instead, in the following decade, the 2010s, there was a global glut of oil. And the apprehension which surrounded peak oil kind of went away. And I think that a lot of this fear of peak oil stemmed from the incoherence of the policies of the Bush administration and the Iraq war, which led to, at that time, a pretty rapid increase in the price of oil. 
And a lot of these people falsely believe the United States had actually invaded Iraq for oil, and they were kind of constructing conspiracy theories out of this false assumption that um, George W. Bush intentionally started the Iraq War for its oil. And they kind of thought that Bush and his administration wanted to invade Iraq, not only to control the oil of Iraq, but to have a commanding position over the oil-rich and natural gas-rich basin of the Middle East, and that as peak oil and, to a certain extent, natural gas peaked, that they would be able to defend off any other countries from taking this oil, and that they would set up, you know, puppet states in Iraq and Iran and Saudi Arabia, and that they would basically suck out the last oil that they had in order so that America would be the strongest economy and collapse last, basically. Bush's policies and the consequences of the Iraq war increased oil prices and seemed to instill in these people and in many people that oil prices would climb indefinitely and seemed to justify this conspiracy and the prepping for a peak oil catastrophe. Yet the prices of oil did not grow indefinitely and actually collapsed during an ensuing glut of oil in the 2010s. Going backwards further was the heyday of the environmental movement in the 1970s. The environmental movement at that time was interested in a great deal of human actions have, having negative consequences both to the environment but also to human ecology. Concurrent to the environmental movement's mainstream popularity, there was actually a much more severe global energy crisis. Um, America's own native oil production peaked in the 1960s and 70s. And so America and the West at large began to depend increasingly upon the Middle East for their oil needs. And then just as in the 2000s with the Iraq War, in the 1970s there was a lot of chaos in the Middle East that led to increasing um, oil prices. Of course you had the Yom Kippur War in 1973, and then you also had the Iranian Revolution of 1979. This 1970s crisis of energy led a lot of people to investigate um, the limits of growth. Of course, limits of growth by the Club of Rome is the most influential study of resource depletion, which came out in 1972. A lot of these people thought that resource depletion and pollution would lead to a Malthusian catastrophe. Yet, as in the 2000s, the interest in this topic and the environmental movement at large was forgotten when an oil glut in the 1980s occurred. Even though oil crunches in the past have been met by oil gluts following them, this, by law of nature, cannot always be the case. Indeed, all resources upon the earth are finite. And indefinite growth cannot continue forever. The loss of fossil fuels such as oil, natural gas, and coal are ultimately guaranteed. As these fossil fuels take millions of years to develop, but only mere minutes to be used. The industrial economy depends upon the creation of cheap energy. And these fossil fuels are the most reliable and dominant form of this cheap energy. And regardless of what we do, eventually they will be exhausted. At a glance though, one would think that you could just simply spend up all these fuels equally until they're completely exhausted. That's not true though. Fossil fuels cannot be used until they're spent and simply dumped for something else. This is, is observed in Hubbard's peak theory the extraction of these resources increases and then ultimately rapidly diminishes. And this diminishment is much faster than the initial buildup. And that's because the demand for them is ever increasing and technologies are in innovated in order to foster faster extraction to feed that demand. When a peak or the highest level of extraction finally does occur, the remaining supply then will be extracted much faster than the initial buildup. If there is no technology already in place to take on the role of that energy or that resource, 
technologies which use fossil fuels would be rendered useless in a rapid supply shock. Since the generation of energy is so important in the very bedrock of the industrial civilization, this catastrophic shock to our energy supplies could likely render the global economy and society at large into a catabolic or cataclysmic collapse. As such, a lot of people and countries and corporations are pushing for investment in alternative technologies which will shoulder the burden of the loss of fossil fuels when they peak upon the global economy. But a lot of people seem to think that these alternative or so-called renewable resources are just wonder technologies which not only will be equal in utility and usefulness to conventional resources or fossil fuels but will surpass them. The grim reality is that alternative sources of energy aren't wonder technologies. In many cases these technologies actually have existed for as long if not longer than the fossil fuel technologies and that the reason that we use fossil fuels for so long was because they are an arguably more efficient and superior technologies. The only rational reason, other than fears of global warming, to use these alternative technologies is because we have exhausted our fossil fuels. Ultimately, the level of innovation which would have to take place to get these alternative technologies into place, though, is gargantuan and has not been done in the amount of time in which these technologies have existed. And the reason for this is because they're so inefficient. So we continue to burn fossil fuels and use fossil fuels and only build a small amount of renewable resources, which even in the most optimistic predictions won't replace fossil fuels for decades and decades to come, if ever. Ultimately, though, despite the name, these renewable resources are not renewable. There is no such thing as a renewable technology, only technologies which will be depleted slower. All the components of these alternative technologies must be replaced. These components cannot be built indefinitely, and they are ultimately just as much a slave to the truism that there cannot be infinite growth on a finite planet as fossil fuels. All resources have their limits. In agriculture, you have a limit of possible tillable land, and with all rare minerals used to build things like computers or electronics, you have a limit to how much can be mined. And eventually, just like fossil fuels, everything will meet a peak and then be used up. Electric cars, for example, depend upon lithium batteries. You can only build so many lithium batteries and they can only last so long. So if you shift from combustion engine cars into electric cars, you're only shifting from one resource to another. Both of these resources are finite. There will be a peak in petroleum, and eventually there will be a peak in lithium. All renewable resources do is continue civilization longer while we shuffle through resources. Keep in mind the predictions of limits to growth and many other studies of the 1970s took into account that we would develop so-called renewable resources and that this so-called renewable resources are merely shifting the burden for longer. And as we approach that final curve of collapse, what to be expected is actually the shifting of resources. So that the burden will be put on one resource, then another, then another, before we ultimately collapse and all resources are exhausted. Ultimately though, I'm different from many proponents of collapse theory because I believe 
that evolution doesn't stop at the neck. And something which is just as important to understand collapse as resource depletion is peak human capital and the exhaustion of human capital. In this initial environmental movement of the 1970s, the, the great wokening hadn't deemed everything racist and sexist and so on so far. So environmentalists were able to study some aspects of human ecology, you know, not necessarily intelligence. They definitely weren't able to study that. But outside of intelligence and outside of race, they were able to measure the impact of industrial civilization upon humans while still shying away from eugenic science and its conclusions. At this time, overpopulation was a major concern. Paul Ehrlich made predictions of runaway population growth resulting in Malthusian collapse. And he based this on his most, in his most famous book and a series of sequels, The Population Bomb, was due to the limits of agricultural production. Though he made highly specific predictions and these predictions have not come to pass. The reason that he, these are often given for their failure was that there was a green revolution that he didn't take into consideration which increased overall agricultural output across the globe. Ultimately, his failure has led to him becoming a straw man for the entire movement of environmentalism and the application of environmentalism towards humans and human ecology in particular. Human ecology is the study of how humans interact with their environment and how this affects them as a species. A much more interesting study of overpopulation having an impact upon human ecology was done by John B. Calhoun. His experience, experiments were commonly known as mouse or rat utopia. In these experiments, he removed all population pressures upon lab rats and attempted to observe unimpeded growth. Rather than increasing exponentially, though, the rats hit a peak population and then ultimately declined into extinction. Calhoun was a member of the Psychological School of Behaviorism. That school focused upon using animals and experiments to model human behavior. The reasoning was that both human and animal psychology was largely a result of external stimuli. As such, Calhoun believed that the antisocial and antinatalist actions of the rats were the result of external stimulus. A narrow reading of his results would be that these behaviors were a result of rodent sensitivity to overcrowding that the development of the rats was prevented by overstimulation and that this overstimulation permanently retarded the rats both in their initial development and then throughout their lives. A more expansive understanding of these results was that the animals are not evolved to exist without these population pressures, that the absence of these pressures will disturb their natural patterns of development and permanently retard them throughout their lives. An even more expansive understanding, which Calhoun was not a party, and which is outside of the Overton window, is that the antisocial and antinatalist behavior of the rats and their ultimate extinction was a result of natural selection. Without the population pressures, the rats did not have a natural selection, and dysgenic deems ultimately dominated the pool, and perhaps the very environment was in effect a natural selection for those very dysgenic genes. As such, an expansive, dissident understanding of these results has clear political implications. The rats developed homosexual behavior in these experiments, self-isolating social behavior, somewhat similar to autism, and a lack of maternal instincts which lowered the birth rates of the rats and ultimately contributed and caused their extinction something which is clearly being mirrored in our modern human societies is abhorrent sexual behavior such as homosexuality and transsexuality are increasing at an exponential rate and birth rates in turn are also steadily declining to understand the detrimental nature of low birth rates first you must understand what eugenics is 
Eugenics is the science of human genetics and how to understand how it affects health and human capital. Eugenics is the most controversial of all sciences as it scientifically measures inborn human inequality. Eugenics first became a science following the Darwinian and Mendelian revolutions of the late 19th century. Once the National Socialist Party came to power in Germany in the 1930s, it enacted a state ideological version of eugenics. This German eugenic policy, which was largely antithetical and heretical to the eugenics then, before it, and after it, was used to justify a whole host of war crimes during the Second World War. As such, eugenics as a whole has permanently been associated with these war crimes, such as the Holocaust of the late German National Socialist regime, and as a result is largely censored throughout all of Western academia and sometimes made outright illegal. Outside of the study of human capital, believers in eugenics want to prevent dysgenics, or native hereditary actions or policies. To prevent dysgenic growth, proposed policies of eugenicists are split into two different categories, positive and negative eugenics. Positive eugenics seeks to create policies which increase the reproduction of people with more attractive genes and who will not be a burden upon the social safety nets of the society at whole. Negative eugenics seeks to prevent people with less attractive genes and who would be a burden upon these social safety nets. Negative eugenics, when enacted, is considered to violate human rights as the policies often involve the sterilization or abortion of these people which are deemed to be of little value to the rest of society. It's worth pointing out that even though eugenics has a bad name, that doesn't mean that governments don't think along eugenic lines when proposing policy or that many people wouldn't support such actions. For instance, almost all people would be supportive of a couple who would not have a child if they knew that that child would have a very high chance of suffering Tay-Sachs disease. Similarly, eugenic policies like child tax credits are very popular and very common throughout the entire world. What many people have a problem with understanding is that human intelligence is highly heritable and the primary determiner of lifetime success. Naturally, human beings do not like being constrained due to a deterministic force. When given an IQ test, many believe that they are destined to that number. As such, they disdain the test individually and believe that their weight when applied to groups throughout society is minimal. Yet, in reality, through the entire his history of the discipline of psychology, sociology, and all sciences which measure human mental processes in society, IQ tests are the most useful and verified statistical data. IQ tests measure what is called general intelligence and simply sh is usually shortened to G. And while it doesn't serve as a perfect one-to-one -one measurement of general intelligence, it is a very close proxy for measuring it. All data points towards the stream heritability of general intelligence and thus of IQ, both within and between groups of humans. Since G is the greatest predictor of lifetime achievement and success, study of intelligence reinforces the reality of economic failure of groups. In short, the success of distinct races and ethnic groups globally and within every nation on earth mirrors their intelligence and cannot be changed through government policy but only through eugenic processes which would increase their intelligence. Furthermore, within races and ethnic groups, intelligence is an incredibly accurate predictor of poverty and poor life choices. Even though the reality of the extreme hereditary nature of intelligence is an insurmountable fact. Researchers who specialize in intelligence are nearly uniformly victimized 
and made into public enemies throughout the West. That's because this grim reality, but inarguable reality, undermines all human efforts at achieving equality. When considering the crisis of declining birth rates, it is impossible to understand the scale of this problem without a true knowledge of the heritability of intelligence. A heritability which is probably stronger than the heritability of height. It is time to examine the demographic transition and its crushing negative consequences on our future. Before the advent of modern medicine, infant and young child mortality was quite high, meaning that the average woman had to have a high amount of children in order for those children on average to become adults. Likewise, the majority of people worked as farm laborers, and it was beneficial to have large families to help the parents work that land. Finally, in the pre-industrial world, women worked from home, not as stay-at-home housewives, but in several capacities. In skilled labor and in shops, they worked with their husbands. In farms, they worked with their husbands. And within the household, there was a great deal of domestic labor which has been subsumed by industrial inventions. In this context, child care was not an economic issue, and women were not postponing childbearing in order to become educated or to start a career. When a society industrializes, it undergoes a demographic transition where it has a rapidly rising population which then plateaus and declines. When a society initially industrializes, women have the same amount of children that they would have had under the previous regime of child mortality. But because these children won't die early on, this causes the country's population to grow quite rapidly. At the same time, medical advances decrease child mortality. Medical advances will also increase the lifespan of everyone in that country, and this also contributes to the rapidly increasing population. Industrialization quickly streamlines agriculture and allows for the society to increase in job specialization, especially in the fields of skilled, bureaucratic, and technical labor. This shift in the workforce out of agriculture results in urbanization where the majority of people leave the countryside and ultimately move into larger cities. Urban populations as a rule have lower birth rates than rural populations. As children are harder to house in cramped urban spaces and agricultural workers will benefit from the children's help upon the farm. Non-industrial farms are routinely run as family businesses and this furly, further reinforces high birth rates. Industrial economies require mass education in order to run the advanced machinery and for highly specialized occupations to be trained. Since numerous electronic devices have been invented which save time and household chores, the domestic economy is no longer a major concern. So women staying at home, especially when they don't have children younger than elementary school age, is no longer seen as being advantageous. As a result, women enter the workplace at an ever-increasing pace. Women who enter the workplace are also educated, and this includes higher education. Once women enter the workplace, they eventually begin to enter occupations which were previously the domain of men, and which often require years for them to establish experience and establish a solid foundation for a career. Mass education, then higher education, and then that time required to establish themselves within a career cause women to de delay their childbearing age and shorten the amount of time which they are open for fertility once they feel they are in a position to begin bearing their children. Likewise, women entering the workplace lowers the power of labor, declines the wages, and ultimately the standard of living of all laborers. A common rule that we will return to is that intelligent people tend to not want to begin bearing children until they feel that they can give those children the same living standard which they themselves had enjoyed. Since the power of labor is lowered and that it is commonplace in most industrial countries to have a dual parent household, this further limits the window of fertility for many couples. Of course, 
This is all under the normal human conditions and fails to take in the effects of artificial horm or hormonal contraception into consideration. The non-invasive nature of hormonal contraception led to a massive cultural shift wherever it went, and as a result, we now have a sexual revolution where the traditional patterns of families no longer apply and the traditional patterns of marriage are no longer a necessity. This, the effects of the sexual revolution indeed are among the most pernicious events ever to occur to the human race, but that is outside the purview of this video. Returning again to hormonal contraception, this allows women to have a nearly assured delay of their fertility within and without the context of marriage. It also has grievous long-term effects which can hamper firm female fertility and their reproductive health. The average and intelligent members of the population are actually capable of using this contraception effectively. Unfortunately though, the less intelligent members are not capable of handling this contraceptives effectively. What eugenicists originally believed would have positive impacts for society because they believed that all people would be able to use these hormonal contraceptives and those who would traditionally not be able to support those children or would their standard of living would diminish if they had those children, they would have chosen not to have the children. And the people that would have been able to support their children and comfortably support their children, they would have chose to have children. The opposite has been true. And the result has been a terrifying dysgenic effect universally across the board for all industrialized civilizations. So the reality is that only the capable women who are more intelligent are able to effectively utilize these hormonal contraceptives. But the downside, other than delaying their fertility, is that it has very adverse effects on their bodies as well and can destroy their reproductive systems with early onset menopause, cervical cancer, and even sterility. While the below average women do not use these or do not effectively use these and then have far more children than their intelligent peers. At the same time, social safety nets have arisen which take care of these less intelligent women and their less intelligent children. And they burden the intelligent people and the intelligent women. And this burden often in the cost of high taxes, but also crime, makes it more and more difficult for the intelligent people to have children of their own. So in effect, contraception subsidizes the birth of less intelligent and less competent people at the cost of the birth of more intelligent and more competent people. Ultimately, these factors taken together incentivize and promote people not to have children. As such, very few industrialized civilizations or societies have a fertility rate which would replace their current population. Societies with very few children and young adults rapidly age, and once the majority of that population is above the age of menopause, this, this aging becomes irreversible and the society will decline in real numbers. A country needs to have a reproductive rate above two children per couple to sustain its current population. It is believed that the minimal number which would be sufficient to sustain the population would be between 2.1 and 2.2 children per person to replace the current population. But that's only sufficient for maintaining the population though. If a society wants to increase in prosperity, it must continually have a large proportion of its population in the workforce, preferably between their 20s and 40s. Once you have a society in which the majority of people are older, then this is a great deal of economic output of the nation which must be put into supporting these older people. 
even before these older people retire, the quality of their output will diminish as they age and their medical cost will increase and increase before they retire. And then it'll ultimately become worse when they retire because they won't be generating any economically productive output for the society at large. Once they begin to live off the social safety nets, then they will become this great burden both in the social safety nets and in the healthcare to extend their lives and this and maintain their standard of living and this stress will be pushed upon the younger generations most especially on the age group of their 20s to 40s and this burden of costs will further reinforce low birth rates and cause these people to shrink their fertility windows as they establish living conditions which they believe will be suitable for their children. This overall result is an indefinite stagnation of the economy, something which has best been seen in Japan. The stagnation comes with a declining number of job openings and career opportunities where entire generations are never able to advance past entry-level positions because the economy is shrinking and those older people are maintaining those entry-level positions for longer and longer. In Japan, this is known as the employment ice age, and it leads to a lost generation which never starts a career. Since they do not start a career, or when they start this career, it's much later than it would have traditionally been in the lives of previous generations, then they will also marry later, if at all, and their fertility when fertility window once they are married will be much smaller. This indefinite stagnation and the stress to support older generations upon this middle productive generation means that the compound low birth rate will come into effect where it will never be arrested and will become self-perpetuating and the, the society will never be able to arrest its low birth rates and it will never be able to arrest its stagnation. Western countries to an extent have tried to overcome this by inviting young immigrants into their countries. This only makes everything much worse, as immigrants do little work and further burden the decline of the social safety nets. And these immigrants are usually from societies of lower average intelligence and further result in the strengthening of these dysgenic trends. Returning to the common rule that intelligent people tend to not want to begin bearing children until they feel that they can give their children uh, an adequate lifestyle, something that's similar to the condition which they were raised under. It's also apparent that many intelligent people beyond this aren't even interested in having children. As such, low birth rates cause a decline in human capital and are aggressively dysgenic. As observed, there are only three groups which reproduce above replacement level. The first is a very small group, that is the elite, who have so much extra capital that they can absorb any cost associated with childbearing. The second group is a much larger group and who in principle are not mutually exclusive with the first group but given the secular ideology of the modern age they often have little to do with the first group and the structures of power. These people are the highly religious people. The type of people who experience religious feelings stronger are also, on average, um, much more fertile naturally and have more children than secular people. Part of this is that many religions also promote traditional family structures and fertility and disapprove of artificial contraception. These first two groups have what could be called a positive eugenic contribution to society, but unfortunately they are dwarfed and are very small compared to the third group. That third group is made of impulsive and unintelligent people. Over time these people make up an ever increasing amount of the parents and then an ever-increasing amount of that total society. 
that this genics of low birth rates results in an increasingly less intelligent and less capable society as it incentivizes the reproduction of less desirable people and disincentivizes the reproduction of desirable people. Studies of human ecology since the 1970s have exited the Overton window as they are antithetical to the ever-increasing movement of the West leftward. Eugenics and the studies of intelligence had already become taboo before the 1970s, especially in regards to differences in intelligence between races. But efforts for equality are predicated upon ever-increasing wealth generated by productivity. To suggest a declining living standards and technological advances means that these goals of equality, especially towards women, will never be attained. Indeed, feminism and its goals are actively anti-natalist as they view women bearing children for society and even for themselves to be oppressive. Their message and goals then are anti-natalist and thus acutely dysgenic. Environmentalists who stress the importance of resource depletion were from the onset demonized by the right in democratic countries long before they were demonized by the left. As the right rightly or wrongly viewed economic growth in the free market as the driver of innovation, as such, any clampdown or controlled conservation of energy resources would stifle economic growth, and that it would simply be better to continue ever-increasing use of energy as this growth would result in continuing innovation and the probable, in their view, the probable innovation of more sustainable and efficient forms of energy, energy production and use, as such many environmentalists then allied with the left. The leftist-oriented environmentalists then abandoned human ecology and grossly underemphasized the dangers of pollution and resource depletion towards humans. Instead, they focused upon the impacts to non-human life and in some cases would become outright anti-human. For the most part, they were neutered by the left and made subservient to their concerns of ever-increasing equality. As the saying goes, greens are in reality watermelons. Below their green skin, they're ultimately red. In a sense, the leftist now wear environmentalism as a skin suit and pay no heed to the terrifying ideas which initially had traction within the 1970s and now have focused solely upon global warming. Whether global warming is true or not, the common mainstream narrative is that its seemingly apocalyptic implications can easily be reversed if only you give money to the corporations who support the mainstream left throughout the first world. The result is that environmentalists have made a deal with the devil on global warming, which all their credibility now stands upon. All other dangers were brought who, which were brought to attention earlier in their movement now have been drowned out by the ever-increasing doldrum of tax subsidies for green companies. Yet so-called renewable uh, resources, which often contribute much more pollution than fossil fuels, believe it or not, do not solve the problem. That's because they are used to increase energy rather than reproduce already existing energy consumption. Even if they were as credible and useful as fossil fuels or nuclear power, nuclear power in reality is just a more efficient fossil fuel, they only increase energy consumption. Sustainability is not viable, though, under any political system. That is because sustainability at best means a plateauing of growth, but more realistically a purposeful decline in the output of the economy, which is known as degrowth. If sustainability were ever enacted, it would amount to nothing more than a very aggressive form of austerity. If there can be any action which leads to the death of a government, it is an attempt to peel back benefits while increasing taxation. It is an open-ended question, and to a certain extent a question of faith, if so-called renewable energies can ever equal the strength and viability of fossil fuels and nuclear energy. What is not a question of faith is that if the shifts towards sustainability outlined in books like Limits to Growth in the 1970s were ever attempted then or today, they would be wildly unpopular and short-lived. The reason that austerity is a non-starter is that governments in the modern world receive their legitimacy through the prosperity of their citizens. 
the single greatest predictor of a government for that state's popularity and longevity is through economic success and perceived continued economic success. It's often forgotten that many of the Warsaw Pact nations whose governments were overthrown in 1989 had enacted aggressive austerity measures, and that these austerity measures probably contrib contributed greatly to their unpopularity, much more so than hatred to Soviet overrule or to their limited political freedom. Likewise, a country like China has an extremely popular government because it is perceived as delivering economic goods. When Putin delivered these economic goods prior to the invasion of Crimea, he was very popular. Now, as the Russian economy is declining because of this adventure in Crimea and because of the oil glut, he's becoming less and less and less popular. In the short run, most people don't care if a country is authoritarian or democratic as long as it delivers the goods of prosperity and continued economic growth. Democratic governments are run short-sightedly, and they have frequent elections over short periods of time, and none of these elected governments has any incentive towards long-term planning. As such, movements towards sustainability or mitigation of Carbon emissions are short-lived and hollow as democratic governments especially, but all government types cannot run a state based on long-term austerity for energy viability in the future. Immediate prosperity will always be the main focus of any government. As such, most of the moves towards sustainability will only extend industrial societies for a shorter period of time. Think of decades longer than they would have there if there was no moves at all. And that's before the bad future ultimately happens and contributes to their collapse. Of course, there is a conflict between human ecology and many modern proponents of environmentalism. It's something I call Malthusian fall folly. That is that many environmentalists call for the shrinking of human impact by willingly having no children. It's by having no children they will shrink the human impact on the economy and be because of the total size of consumers will shrink and therefore the total size of consumption will shrink and these people that never have children will be able to maintain their consumption and their industrial standard of living for longer as i said before this is actually the worst of all possible decisions in the long run though as it contributes to dysgenics being an anglican pastor malthus did not support not having children purposefully or contraception as a way to mitigate poverty. He saw these as evils who undermine the value of human life. As such, I have named this impulse Malthusian folly, as not having children and not having a traditional family structure is a destructive diversion, which seemingly would mitigate the problems of resource scarcity on a first glance, but only make these problems much worse as they contribute to the equally severe problem of dysgenics. First, in that anybody who could willingly take themselves reliably out of the gene pool are those people which are most needed within the gene pool. Secondly, childlessness or a decision never to enter into a marriage leads to apathy and despair. The people who have children are the future, and the people who don't have children, simply put, are not the future. Having children and a spouse is a continuous and conscious decision to invest in future and in hope. To live your life as a man-child for current material wealth will ultimately lead to having a spiritually poor life and without, one without hope which cannot contribute to the future. Returning to the supposed renewable forms of energy such as solar, wind, tidal, hydrogen, and geothermal, it's not that they will never exist. The reality is that they do in fact exist now, and contrary to popular opinion, many of them have been here for some time. We should not see them as a magical replacement, but one which exists in the real world with benefits and with flaws. There is no such thing as a limitless or renewable energy which contributes no pollution. 
These all contribute pollution and are limited by finite resources just as fossil fuels are. Biofuel or biomass, for example, is the oldest known form of energy. Simply burning stuff. Nuclear and hydroelectric power are here and are very useful, much more useful than those earlier inventions I talked about, solar, wind, tidal, and hydrogen, as well as geothermal, but these inventions aren't magical either. They are proven and reliable contributors to daily life. Pound for pound, hydroelectric is the best generator of power. The problem is that there are only so many rivers in the world, and these rivers only exist where they already exist. For all purposes, then, we have already largely met peak hydroelectricity. It is the current base of energy for countries like Canada or Brazil. But if you don't have enough rivers to dam for everyone, or your populations are too far away from those rivers to be useful, then it doesn't matter. Nuclear power is widely opposed by environmentalists. But they, if they were serious about global warming, it would be all that they would talk about has little to no carbon emissions, and unlike all of their wonder techs, which are supposedly rapidly advancing and are going to be much more powerful than fossil fuels, nuclear is already here. And it's not an intermittent source of power. Wind, tidal, and solar powers are intermittent and have to be backed up usually by something which is a firm source of power. So they're pretty weak. Nuclear, on the other hand, is adjustable and a consistent form of energy, perhaps overall the most reliable and ironically the safest form of energy. But the downside is that it must be maintained for decades. The upside is that it is the most truly renewable resource as nuclear reactors can breed more fuel. This new fuel, while ultimately won't be indefinite and infinite, is much more replaceable than the parts of wind turbines, the parts of seawater turbines, or, you know, the laughably inferior parts of the solar batteries. So why is there so much fear surrounding this actual wonder tech of nuclear technology and nuclear energy? Well, it can become very dangerous if misused. Nations which use nuclear energy can produce nuclear weapons and contribute to the problem of nuclear proliferation and the increased likelihood of the use of nuclear weapons. The greatest problem is that nuclear power plants, like I said before, must be maintained well into the future. And while they can be maintained for much longer periods than you know, wind turbines, seawater turbines, and solar cells also produce a great deal of waste waste which is very dangerous and must be safely contained and sealed for several times longer than a human lifetime as time goes on the likelihood of an accident despite the safeguards on nuclear power plants increase Black swan events such as earthquakes or tsunamis can cause disasters, as was the case at Fukushima in 2011 in Japan. As stated, we should expect the short and midterm future, let's think when it comes to midterm, the next few centuries, to be filled with increasingly less intelligent generations who will not be as capable of being Nuclear engineers will not be as capable of maintaining these plants, who will not be as capable of building new plants, and will not be as capable in maintaining and keeping safe this nuclear waste. These ever increasingly stupid generations must be able to continue this and then update these facilities indefinitely. In many ways, I think, ironically, the worst case scenario for the future is what follows. A society which is faced with peak oil, peak natural gas, and then ultimately peak coal has <clears throat> and has dammed all its useful waterways would be pressured and forced into hastily constructing nuclear power plants to sustain its energy needs and to starve off a Malthusian catastrophe. This future society will be less intelligent than our own society currently and that they will have to construct these power plants very rapidly 
and they'll do so using cost-saving equipment and they will have oversights. Think about the Soviet RBM rea RBMK reactors, which led to the Chernobyl catastrophe, who had cost-saving equipment, not the best, but functional equipment, and oversights. Again, the RBMK reactors, the majority of them, and for a very long time were functional, but just one of them blew up, right, Chernobyl? So they're going to build all these reactors, they're going to be less intelligent and build less efficient, less safe reactors. And then this society which built these hastily built, less efficient and less safe reactors would have to upkeep these forever with an ever diminishing human capital. They're becoming increasingly less intelligent as time goes on and they're becoming less able to maintain these waste storage facilities and that they're going to have to put more and more nuclear waste into these facilities. Once the society is no longer capable of building or even maintaining its plants, these plants will then melt down and leave a nuclear tombstone for succeeding generations to be fucked over with for thousands of years to come. The greatest impediment to discussion of the decline and eventual collapse of industrial civilization is the idea of a co instant collapse. Desatopian fiction has trained people to think that if things are going to go downhill, it's going to be very fast rather than gradual. Since much of what I talk about is resource scarcity, then I get lumped into that peak oil crowd that I talked about earlier. A lot of these people were preppers during the 2000s, and their movement and blogosphere, which was concerned about peak oil, was saying that it's going to happen at any minute, and it's going to be really severe, and you're not going to be able to adjust to it, and it's going to die. Think about all those videos I initially made of COVID, where I thought that COVID would decapitate like 20% of the population over the course of like six months or something. That's what they believed in, that you had to try and mitigate this the best you could. Well, that belief in a fast collapse undermines those people who believe in a more realistic and steady version of a collapse. The things won't spike and then instantly collapse, but this is going to plan out over time. And that's a very realistic notion. So if you're going to take, this is what John Michael Greer uses as an example. If you're going to take what the future is going to look like, right? Most people think that the future is either going to be the utopia of Star Trek or the hell world of Mad Max. And they march on to the future thinking that those are the only two outcomes because that's what their media has told them. Now, us collapsed people are us people that say that there's going to be a consistent decline. We're going to be always said to be pointing towards the Mad Max and then everybody can point to us as straw men and they'll use people like Paul Ehrlich with his failed population bomb predictions to say, look, it's not Mad Max yet, you're wrong, we can keep going, you're wrong, It's everything's fine, everything's peachy, right? They're going to point to Mad Max and they're going to point to Paul Ehrlich and say everything's fine. But if you were to bet every year going by is going to be closer to Mad Max than to Star Trek. So every bet, if it's a binomial bet, the person who bets on Mad Max is always going to be closer, but it's never going to quite be Mad Max. It's going to be this lowering staircase. And that's partly because collapse occurs in a time frame which human beings aren't evolved to understand. Human beings are not designed to perceive the world and the changes within it over decades or over generations. In reality, only a few select people are even able to understand investments outside of a single year. Because of this, no matter how many times it is repeated, only a select few people are able to understand the implications of decline and eventual fall of industrial civilization. That's because this is outside of their time preference and that it is probably outside of their understanding and ultimately 
outside of their curiosity and something which they think is not worthy of their attention. This is to the advantage of collapse, as the short time preference of all humans means that politically, economically, and socially, it will be always easier to kick the can down the road than to address this problem. We're turning back to governments again. Every government is built around guaranteeing and promising prosperity in the short term. That's that's where the very legitimacy of governments, whether it's a communist government, a fascist government, a democratic government, any type of government in the industrial world, its legitimacy is based around economic success. And economic success can only occur with increasing growth. But growth cannot increase indefinitely on a finite planet with finite resources. And the reality is that this is a fact because humans, like all other species, are designed to grow until they are pushed back down by a carrying capacity. That is the evolutionary design of all species, not just humans. So when you're saying that you want to degrowth and you want to push this aggressive austerity to try and create a solid state industrial society for generations to come, that's impossible because the very nature of animal life and all life on earth is predicated of growing to a natural limit to their growth. So we are going to exhaust industrial resources and anything else goes against the very core of us as animals. As, as time goes on, this problem of perpetual growth and its need will atrophy and become worse. Eventually, problems like this will reach a point where they will become unsolvable and then we will collapse. Optimism for success for continued industrial civilization is very naive. As observed by Joseph Tainer in his seminal work, Collapse of Complex Societies, societies increase in complexity as far as their resources will allow. This is because both in social complexity or complexity in job specialization and in infrastructural complexity or complexity in utilization of resources and their uses. This complexity is subject to diminishing returns and cannot grow indefinitely. As diminishing returns become greater and greater, complex societies become less and less able to adopt to or overcome their problems. This is because with every investment in complexity, there will be diminishing marginal returns upon that investment. For this reason, the returns that come from early inputs will always be greater than those that will come from later inputs. This is a universal law. A good example of this is in education. The initial investments put into primary school for literacy and numeracy have a massive impact for society and for that child. The second, When you have secondary school, these increases in literacy and numeracy will be continued but they will be proportionately much smaller than those that you got from the initial investments in primary school. Further down the line, investments in post-secondary school and graduate studies will increase literacy and numeracy, but they'll come at an ever-decreasing return on investment and that you're putting in a lot more energy and a lot more specialized people. Think about the intelligence needed for a teacher to teach primary school, right? A lot of primary school teachers are just slightly above average. Then when you go to high school, those people, they're much smarter and specialized than the primary school teachers. Then when you go to post-secondary, right? You have very intelligent, the highest level of, of society and the highest level of intelligence is professors who are teaching post-secondary. And then those same professors, when you get to graduate school, they are teaching you highly intensively, right? An ever-increasing commitment to your education as time goes on really has lower and lower and lower marginal returns at ever-increasing costs. 
the decline in the utility of further investment means that improvements to existing technology can only go so far to reducing pollution and creating more efficient usage of that technology. The great technology breakthroughs which led to industrialization will be normalized and are not being met by further breakthroughs because these further breakthroughs are going to be ever increasingly costly. The advancements that we have are coming at ever greater and greater inputs with ever decreasing return on those investments proportionately. All complex societies have gone down certain routes of investment, which then cannot be changed. This goes far beyond sunk cost as they are integral to the very functioning and oftentimes the identity of those societies. These problems, which will then atrophy in the, until they are unsustainable and then become insurmountable and contribute to the ultimately collapse of that society. The ultimate collapse of a complex society is known as a ca catabolic collapse. This is where a complex society undergoes a radical simplification, which transforms that society into a much simpler form. This transformation can be so radical that the culture and the civilization of that society fades away and is ultimately forgotten. Catabolic collapses, if continued indefinitely, ultimately will result in a dark age where the advances of the society are largely forgotten and that society itself can be forgotten. Think about the Egyptian civilization. Think about the ancient Mesopotamian civilization. Their history was forgotten. Their advances were forgotten. Their cities and their population centers abandoned and left to be consumed by nature. Their achievements, like the pyramids or the ziggurats, left to rot. And their languages, like cuneiform, forgotten. Examples of routes of investment, which would be very difficult to overcome in an increasingly complex United States, follow. First, I got immigration. The United States as a settler polity relied upon immigration on a vast scale in order to grow economically, both agriculturally and then eventually industrially. It had a no long-standing group which made up its population, so these immigrant groups were viewed as more or less fully American. Now, immigration is undermining the unity of the country and is disenfranchising the heritage population of that country. But because of the psychology of previous investment, it is considered integral to the identity of the nation. As more and more of the society is made up of recent immigrants, then the political costs of limiting immigration become insalable. The United States has developed its infrastructure after the 1930s to be based around automobiles. Cities are sprawled out and designed not for foot or even bicycle travel, but exclusively for car travel. With energy scarcity and a dwindling supply of liquid fuel, cars will become unsustainable. Yet the cost of rebuilding American cities towards foot travel or bicycle travel would be of such an extreme cost that any kind of move towards a compacted city design becomes increasingly impossible. And indeed, as we are seeing, the small moves towards a city design which is more pro-bike or more pro-pedestrian inconveniences everyone else which is using cars and is very unpopular. So any movement towards compacting that city design is increasingly impossible. If there is any kind of rapid shock, and this is where the, a lot of the peak oil fear came from, to the crude oil supply, the entire infrastructure of the United States would be rendered obsolete. Now let's turn to a third example, some city planning and some cities which are increasingly unsustainable. In New Orleans is our first example. It is in a port of extreme importance but it is below sea level and must be maintained through complex seawalls which are being eroded by salt water. The salt water is coming into the water table and resulting in the city shrinking and falling down and the elevation of the city declining more and more as it becomes this ever weaker bowl which is only protected by these 
costly flood control mechanisms. So now it is becoming increasingly subject to rapid flooding and storm surges and will eventually become insubstainable. California, on the other hand, one of the largest population centers and one of the most productive agricultural centers, not just of the United States, but of the entire world. It is undergoing significant drought, which is making both of these endeavors increasingly unviable. Abandoning these cities and population centers in these areas of the country would be an immense burden, both economically and socially, so they are sustained with ever-increasing stopgap mechanisms, which will become less and less effective over time. When a government is given a choice between maintaining something which over time is going to become unsustainable and enacting a decision which has radical immediate difficulties and which will take a substantial amount of political and economic capital, it will almost always choose to maintain the longer-term unsustainable things rather than the radical solutions for long-term sustainability. Think about what I talked about with the impossibility of austerity and how almost all, well, by definition, all states depend upon continued economic prosperity for their legitimacy. Yet eventually these problems will reach a threshold where they will become unsolvable due to the limited benefits of further complexity. Going to a society which has already collapsed, the Soviet Union, the, pro the problem of the unproductability of its economic system was allowed to atrophy indefinitely until it ultimately collapsed. And that's because, like the United States, the Soviet Union was a proposition nation or an ideological state. Here, unlike an immigrant society or an immigrant country, the Soviet Union was a socialist state or a Marxist state where its legitimacy depended upon the ideology of Marxism-Leninism. And since addressing this economic problem was politically impossible because it had to continuously pay lip service to socialism, it never addressed it until it was far too late. Like socialism in the Soviet Union, limiting immigration in the United States is politically infeasible and ultimately impossible and will continue indefinitely until that state collapses. On a global scale, then like socialism in the Soviet Union and immigration in the United States, inf infinite growth on a finite planet will continue indefinitely until the entire industrial civilization collapses. Political legitimacy rests upon continued economic growth. As a globe, then all resources, including but not limited to energy resources, will be extracted without regards to this limit of growth. These problems will become increasingly difficult to address until they are ultimately unsolvable. I strongly believe that we have already reached this point. Like the national examples I gave you, the problem will become too intense and the complex system will continue to increase complexity rather than the suicidal and unpopular notion of willing simplification until it is too late, prompting a global collapse. Such a global collapse will not be instant, but will be gradual. However, it will have crushing consequences for the entire human race. The resulting catabolic collapse will be a Malthusian catastrophe, where resources required to maintain the existing infrastructure will be too slim and humanity will not be able to persist above its natural pre-industrial population limit of a billion. Instead, it will crash down from its billions to that single billion. Resource scarcity is a dire threat, but what makes this threat so dire and near impossible to arrest is diminishing human capital. Dysgenics are in full swing globally. Low birth rates means that the intelligent are being replaced by the less intelligent in a compound dysgenic effect. Different races have varying levels of intelligence. Europeans and Northeastern Asians are the most intelligent peoples, and they are the only populations and societies which are capable of creating innovations to reverse the course of our civilization. Every one of their countries has a birth rate which is below replacement and the dysgenic effects of low birth rates are diminishing their human capital. Mass immigration to Europe and the wider West is only making the situation far worse. The people being brought in these countries are less intelligent and then they are transforming these societies 
into less innovative societies. The whites of multiracial societies think South Africa or Brazil. Brazil has, I think, the second or the third most amount of whites or Europeans in the world, but it's not very innovative. And the highly intelligent casts of less intelligent general societies. Think of India, where, right, you have very highly intelligent Brahmins, but they aren't innovative like the peoples of Europe or the peoples of Japan and China. The intelligent of heterogeneous societies and the intelligent of very poor low IQ societies cannot arrest this because they cannot create a society which has the conditions for innovators to arise. And the only societies which are capable of doing this are being wiped away. Their resources in these societies that are coming, these low intelligent and multicultural, multiracial societies, their intelligence and their ability to innovate is going to be diffused within the seceding, more corrupt, violent, and poor societies. And their time and effort is going to be to mitigate those problems. As time goes on, dysgenics will only get worse in the inventions and innovations which people hope can reverse the declines of trend will become ultimately impossible and less and less likely for us to arrest our tombstone, meaning that we cannot get out of this hole which we have dug for ourselves. When the problems we have created become apparent, not just to people like you, the viewer, and me, the video maker, but to everyone across the entire world. It will be too late to arrest it when it becomes apparent to all of society. The resources simply won't be there. The use of non-replaceable resources in our current society means that there will be less for future generations. So if we reach a dysgenic threshold where we cannot innovate, then even if a future society which was more intelligent than us arised, then they cannot use these same resources. We have taken the easy to reach resources and the resources which we are extracting now are increasingly difficult to reach. All resources must meet a positive energy return on investment in order to justify being extracted. As we attempt to extract these difficult to reach resources, we must develop increasingly complex technologies to take them. The increasingly complex technologies which we develop require an increasing amount of resources to use and develop. There will be a point where we will not be able to attain these resources as the energy return on investment would have gotten too high. In a successor society, these resources will never be able to be obtained, as they would not be able to acquire the initial resources to build these highly advanced technologies to reach those remaining resources in the first place. In effect, the more we require technology to extract energy, the more worthless that energy becomes. Ultimately, future societies will be left permanently crippled and will never be able to attain what we have attained now. I have talked very sparingly about pollution and its effects upon our future in this video. The reason for this is that I believe that this dysgenics and the resource depletion on their own are a tango of irrevocable decline. The long-term consequences of any pollution which industrial society has admitted only makes this tango worse. If global warming is anywhere near as dramatic as mainstream politicians claim it to be, it would be assuredly impossible to bridge the gap which I have already outlined here, and it will only contribute to our collapse even faster. In fact, the collapse might actually cut off the dire predictions predicted by these climate hawks long before they can even be achieved. Any global warming or long-term repercussions of pollution, such as diminishing testosterone due to chemical emissions or the leakage of toxic chemicals into water tables, 
ultimately only serves as a multiplier of the severity which I've just laid out. The world doesn't need to burn in order for it to collapse. It is already going to collapse by the decisions we have made and we are tied to this path. Though, should we despair that our species has chosen that path? The answer is no. To despair is cowardice. We are called to make the best of our fate regardless of our ultimate destiny. The decline I've outlined is not a flash in the pan, but is something which will be gradual, at least in terms of human understanding. This is something which occurs over decades and generations. While technology improves our lives, what gives our lives real meaning is the actions we do while we are here. The majority of human history has existed prior to the Industrial Revolution. These people were able to live fulfilling lives, and we can live fulfilling lives just as they did. The future is in our hands to make the best of it.